Hey man, so how you doing? I'm here with uh, Dylan Snook. Um, I just said before we started recording that I was not going to do this kind of weird, phony intro that I'm uh, currently doing right now, but um, Dylan is an up-and-coming artist who is working on uh, Dead by Daylight, um, mm-hmm. right? Is that that's for yeah. Titan? <laughs> Titan comic? Yes, that's for Titan. Titan, yes. That's probably that's the biggest thing you've done so far, right? Yes, that's definitely the biggest thing I've done. Um, I did like a sh- short for Scout Comics. Okay, cool. Um, with uh Brian Wickman, uh for Grit, but uh other than that, this is oh, like my cool. first yeah first published work. That's awesome, man. I mean, published by uh, I guess a more mainstream publisher. Yeah, I think somebody who at least, like, has some properties that, like, people know of, you know, not just, like, something uh, new or anything like that. Not that there's, like, any more validity to, like, a small publisher or anything. Yeah, for sure. And you've also got, like, a couple things, like, you probably can't talk about in recorded yeah. <laughs> audio. <like this. laughs> you can put this on the Patreon. Uh, I'll if it's behind a paywall nobody will hear me uh spill the details but okay no, well we'll get, we'll get into that a little later just so i don't have to go into like editing or whatever so <laughs> the people listening right now you're going to be incentivized to subscribe to my patreon become a patron yeah but all the in a non-sarcastic way yeah um so I guess I just want to get started saying like um like what kind of like comics like got you into comics? I know you're not like you're not one of these guys that was like, "Oh, you're reading comics when you were like, you know, 5 years old." Like I I think you're not no. one of those guys, right? No, not at all. Um... But like what, what was like the early <laughs> stuff that like, you know, you were into that like got you into art, I guess? Cuz you're probably into art from like a relatively young age, right? pretty young um i think like i'm pretty sure the first comic that i was reading when i was younger that i can like remember is sin city oh interesting um yeah so i really liked that when i was younger um probably like 12 13 that's pretty young for sin city yeah um (laughs) i kind of just like my parents just i kind of did whatever i wanted i guess um, no, I mean, I, I don't even really think it's that's bad or anything like that. It, to be honest with you, now that I'm thinking about it, I, you know, I might have read Sin City at like a comparable age, I think. Maybe yeah. 13 or 14. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I have a horrible memory, so I can't remember exactly like when I was reading those, but it was pretty young. And then I didn't really read anything until high school. I had a friend who sort of had a ton like a huge collection and i read like the long halloween and other like batman stuff um and then i think the first like artist that i was super super into who i was like wow i didn't know comics could like be like this um was jerome i'm hoping i'm not butchering his name but i probably am uh opena yeah um i was gonna guess that yeah yeah, which was, uh, I read Uncanny X-Force, and I was like, whoa, this is crazy good. Um, aside from that, yeah, I didn't I didn't really read a ton when I was younger. I, I don't really, like, have a lot of um, uh, historical knowledge of comics and stuff, or even, it's, it might sound bad, but, like, a lot of reverence for, like, the old school people that a lot of others have, you know, people who grew up on you know these bigger names i just never really did yeah definitely i mean part of the whole point of this podcast is that um it's a comics podcast for people who don't read comics so like mm-hmm. and by the way that's like 99 percent of like the general population so like you know <laughs> uh I think you're like the perfect person to talk to about this kind of stuff because like Mm. you're kind of that guy, but then you got into it as an actual career. Like you're not a guy who's like, like you're saying, you're not a guy who's like, Oh, like I've read 
every you know john ramita comic like yeah. i you know i've seen you know you know every kurt swan book like i've seen like you know like you might not even know these names or, or care i and don't <laughs> the, yeah and that's fine yeah, like, i know john ramita i don't know uh kurt yeah swan. of course yeah kurt swan was like uh like was a big time superman artist and was arguably okay. arguably one of the great great superman artists uh this is a little bit of a side note but like uh before him was like this guy wayne boring or like he was really great too but people kind of forget like he's a little overshadowed by mm. kurt swan but um that sucks yeah i mean you know i'm still talking about him though so clearly yeah. you know what i mean his his place <laughs> in history is that. cemented but he's just not as beloved i would argue as like kurt swan but um mm-hmm. Uh, so did you read a lot of stuff when you were younger when like did were you like reading comics like when you were really small yeah yeah I mean I basically like you know this I was reading pretty much as soon as I started reading I like I don't even know what age that is like you know five I guess five to eight or whatever uh Mm -hmm. maybe eight is a little old for reading but um yeah I mean I read I'm like a weird case where I grew up at the perfect time when like borders was still a thing, you know, oh, and yeah, uh, I remember borders. <laughs> they had like a whole, you know, a whole section that was like a graphic novel section. And so I read um, like they had these phone book size, like Marvel essentials. So mm-hmm. like I, one of the first things I read was like amazing Spider-Man, they had these volumes where it would be like, it'd be like 30 issues in a volume. And it was this original run of like, you know, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee on Spider-Man. And it's like kind of crazy looking back on it because like I'm a kid reading these like black and white sort of newsprint comics that like Mm -hmm. were made in like 1963. And, you know, I'm reading it in like, I don't know, 1995 or whatever. You know, like, and I'm not reading it like, oh, this is like, this is like old timey. I'm reading mm-hmm. it like this is like it just came out yesterday or whatever. Right, and um, yeah, I mean, I read a bunch. I read that, and then from there, I like got into all kinds of other stuff. But um, you know, do things like that even exist anymore? Like big like compendiums I... of all like the old classics. I mean, I'm looking at a couple, like I have several volumes of it here. I'm looking at on my shelf, but obviously that doesn't mean that they still make them, but they got to, yeah. I mean, it's a different world now where there's like, there's Marvel unlimited. So sh- I, I'm not a subscriber of Marvel unlimited, but surely, you know, you could subscribe to that and it probably has everything that I'm talking about on there. I mean, and it, right. by the way, the stuff I was reading, like I said, was like in black and white. So if mm-hmm. it's on Marvel Unlimited, I assume it's probably going to be in color. It's a whole complicated thing where, like, is it going to be, like, remastered colors on Marvel Unlimited? Like, is it going to be bad colors, you know? Because well, uh, um... <laughs> then I kind of yeah. prefer it to be black and white. I don't know. So but, I uh... guess the originals were in color, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm of course. curious why they are reproduced on, like, newsprint and black and white. Though. It's probably I guess because it's cheaper. Cheap. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it didn't bother me as a kid. I didn't even think about that. I was just like, oh, this is the way it is. Like, I didn't think, like, that I was missing something, I guess. But yeah, um, that makes sense. I, I really recommend, like, I still, to this day, like, I love the original run of, like, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko on Spider-Man. And I, you know... After that, after Steve Ditko was done, he did like something like, God, the people who are like hardcore are going to be so annoyed at me. But he did something like, I think, like 33 or maybe 39 issues Ditko before he quit. And then John Romita came on. And I'm just saying, I also, you know, I probably read like 50 to 100 of the John Romita stuff. And that's great, too. I'm just trying to say, like, I'm not trying to diminish John Romita either. Um but uh somebody's yeah. gonna get mad yeah, for you. yeah, yeah mad yeah. about it <laughs> yeah what can you do I, he died recently john ramita it's just like 
when these guys start dying to me, it's just so it's like when Steve Ditko died, I was like, how can Steve Ditko just die? Like, I know that's like a silly thing to say. Like, of mm. course, everybody dies, but <laughs> I don't know. He can't just die. I mean... Like <laughs> Steve Ditko. I feel the same way again. Some people might get mad at me about this, but I feel the same way about like Pee Wee Herman. Like, you can't just fucking yeah. die. What do you mean? I don't know, but I know that's the dumbest thing to think. But <laughs> Pee Wee was a little young, though. Like, Steve Ditko was like 95, you know? Pee Wee was like wow, 70. Oh, he lived that long. I think so. I could be wrong about his exact age, but I think he was into his 90s. Wow. I kind of like don't expect any cartoonist to like live <laughs> that long. Stan Lee Good was like ninety eight, I think. Yeah, but he wasn't a cartoonist. Yeah, that's true. That's true, that's true. <laughs> but uh, he wasn't like bent over a drawing table for decades yeah. and decades. But uh, it's crazy to. Hard work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy to think, um, like Steve Ditko, like just crazy to think, like when the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie came out, he's just like living in like a small apartment and he just like does not give a fuck. He's like, you know what I'm saying? Like he could have been like an interview in the New York Times. Mm. He just like did was not interested. He just like did not want to do that. He was like a recluse, you know? I wonder why. Yeah. He had like a whole... Um... Have you read Watchmen? Are you like a Watchmen? Um... Yeah, I have, Person? but uh, it's been, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have, but it's been a while. Um, you know, like uh, Rorschach, um, how Rorschach was like, things are black and white, like, you know, you know, there's mm -hmm. no compromise, like, you mm -hmm. know, you're either good or evil. That was kind of like a parody of uh, Ditko had this character called Mr. A, and mm -hmm. Rorschach was like kind of a mashup of a parody of Mr. A and another Ditko character called the question. And okay. um, Ditko just like was a big time, like I'm going to mispronounce this. I feel like an idiot, but like he was a big time, like Ayn Rand guy. Okay. And he was like hardcore, like objectivist, which like, I'm not like an Ayn Rand expert. I don't even know what it means. I guess, I, I guess it just means like, things are either good or they're bad. Like, you know, like right. there is no compromise. Like, you know, you're either like a, a Titan of industry or you're like a moocher who's like leeching off the, the great men, you know, like oh. the Steve Jobses of this world. That's, yeah, His that attitude, sounds like a great way to do. I mean, he prob I think he probably is on record as being like the work speaks for itself. Like, why do you want to talk to me? Like, mm. why do you want to talk to me? Like, you know, read my work and then everything I have to say is there. Like, so it's just like this whole it's I mean, you know, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. So I'm talking too much, but it's just <laughs> no, this, this whole I mean, it's, a it's this whole right? fascinating thing where it's like Steve Ditko and Stan Lee were like these opposite guys where like Stan mm. Lee was like, no, everybody talk to me like. Talk to me. I, I, you know, know my name, like know my face. Yeah. Like, I, anyone who wants to talk to me, like I'll talk to you. Like, and he was just like an open book and Steve Ditko just like chose the opposite path where he was just like, fuck you, write me a letter. And even then I'll probably, if you write me a letter, I'll probably respond with like one sentence being like, I don't care. Signed Steve Ditko. <laughs> like he's actually that seems like, so weird to me. He's a weird guy, but you know, it's like, I respect it on some level because he went, he, he, at no time did he break. Like he did that like for like a hundred years or how, you know, yeah. however long. It makes he sense that he's really old because I feel like super spiteful people always. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't even know. Long as possible. I don't even know if I would say spiteful, but just like, you know, who knows? Like he just had mm. this kind of like personality of just like, I don't want to talk to you. Like I want to do my work and on a certain level, I respect it. Like I wish that I could do the same thing. Like I wish I could just write comics and, you know, 
I don't know, but it's like not the world we live in or whatever. Well, I mean, I just, I guess I find it kind of interesting because like you're drawing like, you said Spider-Man with Steve Ditko? Yeah, he did Spider-Man. He did, by the way, he like basically created Doctor Strange. I mean, like Stan oh. Lee's name is on it, but like sure. it was like 99.9%. Right? Yeah, but this was like especially like it was like I get the sense that like Stan Lee was like, oh, you want to do a magic hero? OK, that's fine. I guess do whatever you're going to do. <laughs> just like, you know, Dicko just like did his thing. Like mm. at least with Spider-Man, Stan Lee is like at least he's like, I want to do a character called Spider-Man that climbs on walls. And so, you know what I'm saying? At least he had that uh, <laughs> yeah, drive to want to do it. Fantastic input. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, I don't know. This is a whole like thorny subject to get into that literally I'll probably yeah. do like I'll probably do a two hour podcast just about this because, uh, you know, people like demonize Stan Lee or whatever. And I'm and there's mm -hmm. plenty to demonize about him. But like, sure. I don't think he had like, I don't think Marvel would exist if Stan Lee had not been such a like a marketing powerhouse like you know people will probably get mad at me for this but uh like i i kind of see stan lee as like he's like sort of like a benign donald trump in a way he's you know what i'm saying he's like this kind of no. he's like no, not, not sure. like trump is like pretty much just evil like he's like he's a trying to be he's like neo hitler like he's like a bad guy but there are you know the whole marketing aspect of it is like it's like stan lee it's like in another life donald trump would have just been stan lee of course people are gonna hear this and they're gonna be like yeah, yeah that's why stan lee is bad <laughs> and maybe maybe you're right i don't know but I'm just saying, if you go back and you look at these early comics, these early Marvel comics, the whole style of it would be like, on the cover, there'd be like a blurb that would be like, this is the greatest Marvel comic you've ever seen. Like, it's going to blow your mind. And I know that seems like, like, oh, what's the big deal? At the time, right. it was a very big deal. Because if you go and look at the Justice League, you know, uh, contemporary with those kind of Marvel, that kind of Marvel um, marketing message that Stan Lee was doing, like Justice League wouldn't be anything like that. It would just be like, you know, uh, just you have what's on the cover and be like, we're fighting a monster today. And there's just no, you know, you know, Marvel was speaking directly to you. Um, and I think, you know, for all of Stan Lee's like kind of glory hogging flaws of, <laughs> of which he had many like yeah. um you know marvel would not exist it would be something else it would be you know it it, it was like marvel as we know it today yeah it, yeah it wouldn't maybe exist that would be like, a good thing <laughs> yeah i don't know maybe yeah i mean it's um it's i don't like know a hype machine no i'm not trying to defend the guy because like i'm just saying he had his positive aspects you know that i sure. think are admirable like but there's other things like um you know i remember uh i think the guy's name is jonathan ross he's like a british tv presenter guy he did this documentary i think was called searching for steve ditko i think or something uh -huh. to that effect and it basically was all about steve ditko and by the way he went to like his apartment and steve ditko was just like yeah i don't want to talk to you like just to show you like how committed he was like to the bit. Like he was just just like, I don't want to talk to you. Like, sorry. Like he was like at his door, like with cameras and stuff. Um that's really funny. <laughs> they he interviewed Stan Lee for that. And mm -hmm. it was, I gotta say, like it was one of the most fascinating clips of Stan Lee I've ever seen because he got like he kept pushing him on this point of like come on like who created spider-man like really like come on he was mm -hmm. like really pushing him on this and he got mm -hmm. stan lee to be like okay look like you know you know i say steve ditko gets credit but like come on like i came up with the idea like me i came up with it like he's kind of he says almost exactly that so like and i'm saying that's bad like i'm not saying that's <laughs> that's like a bad 
you could tell <laughs> he was he was keeping up the Stan Lee character, but in mm-hmm. one in in my opinion, one of the most fascinating moments in Stan Lee history, like Jonathan Ross got him for like a second to break and be like, come on, like come, just give me a break here. He basically was saying, yeah. like, I did it, me. Like he, so in his heart of hearts, even though he says he thinks Steve Ditko is like a co-creator, I think in his heart of hearts, he's really like he Fuck thinks you, it's man. all him. Yeah, like I think on some <laughs> level he he thinks it was it was my idea. Like he basically said well, that. But, yeah, but like think about everything that makes Spider-Man such a popular character. Like how little of it is like you know. Yeah, no, I mean and like you know, if somebody's like, let's make a Spider-Man character and he climbs on walls, like any number sure, of artists could have sure. interpreted that idea in like it's, a million it's, different ways. Definitely. I mean, it's a complicated thing because, again, like, I don't think Spider-Man would exist if not for Stan Lee, because he just it was it was this weird alchemical combination between Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, where Steve Ditko is just like this hermit uh, guy. And you could see that in this early Spider-Man, by the way, like. People see, um, people see like the Tom Holland Spider Man now, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh, like you know, he's this cute kid. He's going to Europe. Like you know, he, he's dating Zendaya. Like he's like, he seems cool, and he's like a he's like a good kid. Like it was not mm-hmm. like that in the original like Steve Ditko issues. Like Peter oh, Parker okay. was like a weird outcast, like kind of a bitter." like misanthropic guy like he was like weird and he was like kind of bitter like he like there's a there's a issue where um there's this kid who was a bully like flash thompson you've probably seen him Mm -hmm. in some of these movies but he bit like they basically are like he was like gonna have a boxing match match literally like in a boxing ring with gloves and stuff with peter Mm -hmm. parker And Peter Parker did it like he was like, Uh yeah, you know, fuck this guy. Like, I'm sick of this shit. Like, I'm (laughs) Spider-Man secretly and I have to put up with this shit. Like, fuck this. And he basically like fought Flash Thompson, like holding back all his superpower strength. And then Mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, he basically like knocked him out using like, you know, one (sighs) one hundredth of his superpowers. And I'm saying this is the kind of shit where like he was not a good guy. And, um, I mean, it's not that he wasn't a good guy. He was just, he had a edge to him, like a bitter edge. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from Steve Ditko, but it's like, you know, there was another thing where, uh, Peter Parker was like walking through college campus and there was like, uh, like a protest going on, which was like a big thing in the sixties, obviously, and Steve Ditko had Peter Parker being like, fuck these fucking protesters, like goddamn idiot protesters. Like, you know, he didn't say these, ob- these I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but sure. he's like, he's like, you know, you know, projecting go back to class. <laughs> yeah, he's like this okay. Ayn Randian kind of philosophy, like go back to class, you fucking morons. Like that was kind That's of his so attitude. Weird. And, and Stan Lee changed it to being like oh well you know i i I like i respect their right to protest but like (laughs) i I don't know maybe it's a little much for me but good good for them like he changed it to something like that i'm saying like in that instance i think stan lee was probably right you know you see what i'm saying like it's like sure sure but whether that's like his own beliefs or his like reading the you know the crowd and stuff like that the spider-man we know emerged from like a weird combination of a guy like Stan Lee, who was like this like hype man and this like, you know, larger than life charismatic character. And like Steve Ditko, who was like, fuck you, I'm drawing. Like, I don't want to talk to you. Like, and it's through that weird fusion that you get this character. And I'm not, and listen, Stan Lee (laughs) did not draw spider-man he didn't draw the costume which is huge he didn't draw j like j jonah jameson 
was very likely like a mockery of Stan Lee. Like it mm. probably was like designed to be mocking Stan Lee. So, you know, I'm <laughs> trying to say a lot of it emerges from Steve Ditko for sure. Like I think Peter Parker was probably a little bit of like a self portrait of Steve Ditko himself. Yeah. With like these glasses and like, he, he probably looked like Steve Ditko as a teenager. I imagine. Mm. And by the way, there's like barely any pictures of Steve Ditko that exists. There's like two pictures. <laughs> I'm actually curious to see him now. He looks like um, old Peter Parker. I think I know what you mean of like the character sort of, you know, exists because of the sort of conflict between the two of them. Okay. I see. Yeah. I mean, you know, that having been said, I bet you almost every issue is just like Stan Lee is like, oh, I want him to fight a guy called Dr. Octopus. And, you know, and that's all he said, basically. And Steve Ditko yeah. just like made the comic. So. Sure. I guess like the way I see it is like so much of the, like coming up with the name Dr. Octopus that could take like, you know, five minutes, 10 For minutes. For sure. Yeah. You know? No, I agree with you. I'm just saying it's, it's, there's something to Stan Lee that he added something, but I agree with you a hundred percent that like he, you know, the design of many of these Spider-Man villains in my opinion, are some of the best comic book designs like ever made. Like Dr. Octopus is like a great, great design. And those stories with him are great. And I think probably 80 to 90% of the actual plot of the stories was by Steve Ditko. And in fact, in the later issues, oh God, I'm going to butcher this. But in the later issues, at one point, um, I think it was like on the cover or maybe on the interior cover, like mm -hmm. uh, Stan Lee has a little blurb that says like, oh, you know, just to throw him a bone, we're going to say uh, Steve Ditko here is credited as like co-plotter just to just to throw him a bone. Or so he had like a comment like that. That's like kind of oh, passive that's aggressive. so irritating. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying he was credited there as a, you know, he was crediting him there like kind of as a co-writer a little bit. So clearly, yeah, he had consciousness of that, like that he, you know what I mean? Sure, but like, why not just? Well, I mean, I guess you never know what they're like behind the scenes. That's the thing about like all of these people; they have personalities that are gonna like conflict with each other if they have to like work in proximity. Especially, it sounds like Steve Ditko is a little bit of a. Um, I don't want to use the wrong word. <laughs> no, you said it now. Now this is going to be clipped Critter. on. We're going to we're going to put this. What I was going to say. <laughs> we're going to clip this just this part on Twitter. Yeah. We're going to put that on there, and we're going to skip yeah. all the parts where I was defending Stan Lee that I'm sure everyone <laughs> will be mad at me about. I think, like, I guess I, you know, I don't know enough about like the history of them to like make a judgment call, but I think like. When you when you hear things like that about Stanley, it comes across as a very like annoying, passive aggressive, like definitely taking credit I mean, taking credit for a majority of these ideas when it's like you might have been the promoter, which like sure there is obviously like uh, an art to that and an importance to that if you're trying to make money, and I'm sure a lot of what you know he brought to the table is what made them as popular as you're saying and like sort of spiraled into what it is today but yeah definitely i mean i'm actually gonna try to find like i swear i could i could swear to you that he made like kind of a passive aggressive comment he made like a comment that's like oh you know just just to be nice for a change and because he begged me so much like he said something uh -huh. like that I swear, I, I mean, I'm trying to it. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, though, of like, Marvel would not exist without Stan Lee. It's like, I'm looking at one of these pages here, and he has this, like, caption that says, oh, look, here, yeah, this is, okay, this is an example. He has Steve Ditko credited uh, dazzling drawings by Steve Ditko, but then he has right next to it a little caption that says, sturdy Steve Ditko 
dreamed up the plot of this tantalizing tale and it's full so what the fuck like steve dicko <laughs> dreamed up the plot what why is steve dicko not credited as the writer then you yeah, said you well, know what i'm saying it's like so baffling sure like, i mean yeah i wish i knew <laughs> oh here it is okay and then it's in the like next these issue things are still exists like today as well with like comics you know there's still this back and forth of like writers versus artists and like who's actually doing yeah, the most definitely. work and who's the most important yeah definitely i mean i feel a little bit like i'm sticking my hand in a uh, hornet's nest here by saying this but just just into the next the next issue it says painstakingly plotted and drawn by steve dick so you see there's like an evolution here where like by the next issue he is crediting him as plotting it mm-hmm. you know so there's clearly but is he still credited as a writer stan lee it says yeah it says scripted by stan lee mm-hmm. but and and what does that mean that means the captions and the word balloons and stuff I yeah assume. sure writing writing out the ideas in a way that's like digestible i guess and there's a shitload of word balloons and captions on this so i'm I'm not saying it's nothing but like i don't know i don't know i don't know that you could even say i don't know i don't know you could say you script you scripted it and by the way you know and then now the next issues it says it continues to say plotted by steve ditko so Okay, well, that doesn't sound as passive aggressive as you were like making. He it had, out. I could swear to you, he had a comment <laughs> that's like, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I, I, I'm pretty sure there's a comment where he's like, just you're just trying to get everybody bone. fired up. <laughs> he says something like that. I'm pretty sure. I could definitely, that. I could definitely see him saying something like that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, li- listen to this. Well, never mind. I was going to say, there's another one where he says something where he's like, this could be our be nice to Stevie Ditko issue because it is like featured Doctor Strange. Uh And he says, "Uh, Steve Arino dreamed this one up. So he's again, he's just saying like, Steve Ditko wrote this, but I'm still going to be credited (laughs) as writer. But he did write it. I'm t- I'm saying that. Like Yikes. it's bizarre. I can't believe he called him Stevie. That's so oh. condescending. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was his whole style, but like here in the next issue, he has like the little caption that says the, the credits. Mm-hmm. And he has an arrow pointing to Steve Ditko that says when Academy Award time rolls around, leave us not forget. And it's like pointing at Steve Ditko. So like what? He's like kind of saying, like, like, what does that mean? Does that mean like behind the scenes, like Ditko like wants more credit? And so now Stan Lee is like kind of mocking him a little bit. I don't know. There's so much drama. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. It was part of the style of like I'm saying, like, you know. DC wasn't doing anything like that. Like it's like it's it's speaking directly to you. So that is part of the style and it is part of the success of Marvel, in my opinion. But you see what I'm saying? That it's like he's like almost like, how would you feel if you're Steve Ditko and you read that? Like, you know, you'd probably be like, Can you read it to me again? Can can you read it to me again? Ah, it's gonna be tough because I just I just put the thing oh, down, but it, it was like, uh, what did I say? It was like when Academy <laughs> Award time rolls around. I need to work on my Stan Lee impression, but yeah, it was like when you Academy just turn Award the whole time. Podcast <laughs> just like do the podcast as Stan Lee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here it yeah. is. When Academy Award time rolls around, leave us not forget. Dot dot dot. And then it has a, <laughs> it it's like just... the caption is in the shape of an arrow. Pointing sure, to Steve Dicko. I would just be confused. <laughs> I would be like, what are you even fucking talking about, Stan? This he he probably was like, it probably was like Ditko was trying to get more credit and then, you know, Stan Lee like kind of openly mocks him like on the, on in not on the cover, but in the pages of it. 
and he said and i'm looking at a later issue and he stopped credit he stopped giving him plotting credit later here i see i definitely wouldn't be like but then it nice goes back. What's to that? any writer who i wouldn't be nice to a writer who like had that attitude towards me at all yeah i mean i yeah it's hard to even know this is like like you were saying before this is like all private stuff it's we don't know yeah. really it's like crazy to look back like um jack kirby did this interview mm -hmm. in the 90s uh when he was like pretty old like you probably was like he might he may have been in his 80s by that point he would like die okay. a couple of years after this but he did an interview where he was like i created the fantastic four okay like like marvel was out of business and they were carrying desks out of the office and like they were like movers were like emptying out the office and Stan Lee was sitting on his desk crying, being like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I came in there and I was like, "We're I'm going to whip up a bunch of characters and like, this is what we're going to do. Like, I'm going to invent the Fantastic Four and like, stop crying. And like, this is almost like a, it's wow. almost verbatim what he said. So was it like that? I don't know. Like, I, I don't mean, know. It must have been like, it's to some know. degree. I don't know. I mean, think about think about the creation process for you. Like, I'd imagine you go through a good amount of things, like in your personal life, that like you are bringing to the table when you're sort of you know working on these stories, working on the art. So it sort of makes sense to me that like there would be sort of a lot of uh, turmoil and drama, especially when you're in you know, these guys positions where it's like sort of a business venture on top of uh, like a creative venture. Um, it's honestly really funny <laughs> to hear um, that. I guess he was like freaking out and doubting himself. Um, I guess it's kind of like, yeah, just interesting to hear that. I guess everybody goes through that kind of stuff yeah definitely i mean i really think you have to you have to take this with a grain of salt you know i this is like i we don't know what happened is the thing like you know um jack kirby uh made this like i'm trying to scroll through this thing now and see if i could find the exact quote that would be awesome if i could but i'm, I'm not sure but uh jack kirby made this team called uh, challengers of the unknown for dc mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you look if you look up a picture of that it is basically um the fantastic four like he basically made the fantastic four already and mm -hmm. um so you know right there is an the argument that like yeah he just recycled something that he already did not recycled but he, he retooled it i guess and um it's recycling right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that it's hard to, it, it's, you know, Fantastic Four was, you know, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around now, especially because Fantastic Four, like, peop, it's kind of a joke today, like, among the mainstream culture, I'm saying, like, people don't get it, like, they just see, oh, they've tried to make movies about it several times, and it never works, therefore, it must be garbage, right? Like, that's what the average attitude is, I think. But it really sure. was like, you know, the Fantastic Four basically created Marvel and it was a, it was really a big innovation. And in then it was like prior to the Fantastic Four, you know, a superhero team would be like Justice League and it would just be like everybody's buddies like Batman and Superman. Like they shake hands and then they they drink a, gl a warm glass of milk and they're, you know, they're friends, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like. There was no interpersonal or there wasn't much interpersonal conflict. And right. now the Fantastic Four comes around and like the thing is like, you know, Ben Grimm, the thing is like, I'm a fucking monster, man. He's like, he's like, look at me. I'm a rock monster. What the fuck did you do to me? Like Reed Richards, you turned me into like a rock man. Like, and the, you know, the thing and, um, the human torch were like constantly bickering, you know, uh, you know, 
I don't know. I'm trying to like basically summarize what the Fantastic Four was now, but um, well, at the same guess... time, by the way, I'm scrolling through and I'm trying to find Kirby just completely unloading on uh, <laughs> Stan Lee, but I, can't, I haven't found it. Yeah, see, look, uh, he's talking about Challengers of the Unknown here. He's saying like Challengers of the Unknown was a movie to me. The science fiction pictures were beginning to break and I felt that the Challengers of the Unknown were part of that genre. I began to think about three words which have always puzzled me. What's out there? Okay, what's out there? I didn't care about the East Side anymore. I didn't care about Earth or anything like that. I thought, what's really out there? You know, that's that's pretty, I mean, I'm not just going to read this huge paragraph of Jack Kirby, but it's pretty interesting just to read. He was like, a, yesterday was, his, was uh, this is probably going to come out in a while, but uh Yesterday was Jack Kirby's birthday, so that's on my mind a little bit. But um, oh, happy belated birthday, rest in peace. You didn't see that on um, Twitter, like uh, I have not. Read. I'm so checked out. I've yeah, I got like, you. I yeah. I've retweeted a couple of the Jack Kirby things, and I I even did one of my own one of my own posts. But uh, I was super tempted last night to tweet something like, "Was it somebody's birthday?" today i feel like a or something like that but i restrained myself and held it back to say it now <laughs> but uh like i'm i'm reading this part now um uh it's like when did you meet stan lee for the first time and a lot of people don't know this but it's like kirby now is saying i met stan lee when i first went to work for marvel he was a little boy when joe and i were doing captain america <laughs> He was about 13 years old. He's, you know, he was about five year, years younger than me. So like Jack Kirby's 18 creating Captain America, by the way, when he's 18 years old and Stan Lee is like this fucking annoying kid. Like, and this is literally what he says. He's saying like, you know, he was the kind of kid that liked to fool around, open and close doors on you. Yeah. In fact, one time I told Joe to throw him out and, uh, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm getting close now to here. He is saying like, uh, on all the monster stories, it says Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. What did he do to warrant his name being on them? Jack Kirby says nothing. Okay. And then the other guy's like, uh, Groth. It says, did he dialogue them? No, I dialogue them. If Stan Lee ever got a thing dialogued, he would get it from someone working in the office. I would write out the whole story in the back of every page. I would write the dialogue on the back or a description of what was going on. Then Stan Lee would hand them to some guy and he would write in the dialogue. In this way, Stan Lee made more pay than he did as an editor. This is why this is the way Stan Lee became the writer. Besides collecting the editor's pay, he collected the writer's pay. I'm not Stan Lee. I'm not saying Stan Lee had a bad business head on. I think he took advantage of whoever was working for him. So that's pretty that's that's pretty strong words but yeah i mean it's hard to know how much of this is true really because at this point jack kirby you know i think you could say there's a touch of like bitterness to see stan lee get so much credit and jack kirby sure. just to be unknown you know yeah i mean Here I, I guess i don't know like oh, okay sorry you can no, go ahead uh, I was just gonna say, like, was Stanley like super wealthy? Like, I don't really know, like, I what think... kind of like money he made from, you know, his association with Marvel. I always yeah. assumed he was wealthy, but I guess you can never really tell. You know, it's complicated. Um, he definitely died wealthy for sure, but um, you know, I'm trying to think when this interview took place is probably like. I want to say like, God, it had to be like 91 or like it, per, perhaps it was even in the late eighties, but um, Stan Lee uh, worked out a deal where he was like uh publisher emeritus or something or emeritus. Uh, he was editor emeritus, which means like he basically was paid a million dollars a year to be like walt disney basically to be like a living a mascot million, like literally a million dollars yeah but my timeline what? is sketchy to be a mascot? on this 
Yeah, yeah I mean, I, you know, it didn't say, it probably didn't say the, you know, probably didn't say I mean, those he kind words, of was. Right, yeah, yeah, course. yeah. He you probably was like, as much as you want, and still a mascot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But um, he, he might not have thought of it that way. I don't know. But uh, I don't know when that started. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if at the time of Kirby saying this, but um, that he had that deal. But, um, sure. you know, Stan Lee, like Jack Kirby is saying mm-hmm. here, was always like a good businessman in the sense that like, you know, at the height of like the Marvel Renaissance or whatever in the 60s, you know, Stan Lee quickly understood um, and he marketed to like he understood that like college kids were reading this and he was like intentionally, you know, marketing to them. And he understood like, okay, this college will pay me to like go speak there. So he literally would just be like going around the country, like speaking at colleges. And it's just like on a certain level, it's just like free money sort of like, it's almost like, you know, I made that comparison to Trump before, but it's almost like a politician on a certain level. Like he's just like, it's like Hillary Clinton talking to, you know, giving a $50,000 speech. Like, you know, I don't know what kind of money he was making from those, but like, I guarantee you, like Steve Ditko was not making that money. Like Jack Kirby was not making that money. And, you know, I don't know. Um, It's just totally an accident that Stan Lee was like good at like public speaking. And it it really has nothing to do with the comics. Um, You know, I don't know. But uh, I found this thing now where, uh, you know, Jack Kirby says this. He says, um, it came about very simply. I came into the Marvel offices and they were moving out the furniture. They were taking desks out and I needed the work. I had a family and a house and all of a sudden Marvel is coming apart. Stan Lee is sitting on a chair crying. He didn't know what to do. He's sitting on a chair crying. He was, he was just still out of his adolescence. I told him to stop crying. I says, go into Martin and tell him to stop moving the furniture out and I'll see that the books make money. And I came up with a raft of new books and all these books began to make money. Somehow they had faith in me. I knew I could do it, but I had to come up with the fresh characters that nobody had seen before. I came up with the Fantastic Four. I came up with with Thor. Whatever it took to sell a book, I came up with. Stan Lee has never been editorial minded. It wasn't possible for a man like Stan Lee to come up with new things or old things for that matter. Stan Lee wasn't a guy that read or told stories. Stan Lee was a guy that knew where the papers were or who was coming to visit that day. Stan Lee is essentially an Ooh. office worker. Okay. I'm something else. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it goes on. Wow. But, so that's yeah. hardcore, right? Like, I mean, I would tend to believe that. You know what I mean? People aren't just going to say this stuff for nothing. And it's interesting because I I feel like Stan Lee's, you know, he has this big persona, you know what I mean? He made sure he had all his um, cameos in the movies and stuff like that, which, you know, the more I saw them and I guess not that I'm like well read on the history and like Stan Lee's attitude and all that stuff. But I knew enough that like the longer I, you know, the more cameos I saw, I was like kind of rolling my eyes about them because it's sort of like he is a little bit of a mascot. Never, and by the way, that's that's part of his uh, contract, you know, to, to those cameos to be like, in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not just like, oh, let's be nice to the old, old, kindly well, was Stanley. It, that was like in was the deal. Like, like he wanted to be in the cameos. Or yeah, like, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think he he probably like, again, this is part of him being like a savvy, you know, smart business guy that like he made sure that was in the deal it's not an accident that you know if you ask the average person on the street who created spider-man they'll say stan lee it's because of like his design you know but i'm not saying oh that means it's good but what's that i said that makes him sound like a mastermind a little bit more yeah i mean you know who knows maybe he had a good like business manager that told him to do that like so it's not, not you know we don't even know but um, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. They're like, I don't know. I have a hard time believing this line that like Stan Lee was just an office worker. Like, I think that's a little extreme, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like I can see what he's saying. Essentially an office worker where it's like, you're not like, 
doing any of the things that are like essential for like what he's saying is I'm something different. I'm a storyteller. Like I could, I guess it's, it's not like inherently like a bad thing to just be an office worker. Right. Like there has to be like technical minded people in comics. Right. And there's all sorts of different like jobs involved in making comics that, you know, some require creativity and some require like technical precision and stuff like that. So I don't think it's necessarily like, maybe he meant it to be a little bit insulting, but I don't think like it's inherently insulting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, um, I don't know. All I'm saying is like, I wasn't there. I don't know. I I mean, I was, (laughs) I'm going through this and it's just like, I'm going through this and uh, you know, they talk about how Stan Lee says he created all the fantastic four characters. And then Jack Kirby was like, no, he didn't. So it's, you know, it's uh, it's like one guy says this, the other guy says that I think probably one thing I know is like Jack Kirby absolutely deserves about a million times more credit than he gets in like the public imagination. You know, like if, if you ask, 10 people on the street i think 10 out of 10 will know who stan lee is and 10 out of 10 will not know who jack kirby is and that is like a crime like he literally i mean i sound like i'm going overboard with the flattery now but like jack kirby's work should like be in the louvre like it's like you know you know there's no marvel without stan lee but there's definitely no marvel without jack kirby also sure I have not read um I don't think I've read anything by Jack Kirby. Um, yeah, I mean, you could kind of just look at the art though. You know what I'm saying? Um, sure. It's not for everybody, I'll also say. Like he has a certain style that's like I think what's impressive about Jack Kirby is how much he did, like how many pages right. he was able to do. Yeah. And like maintain a level of consistency like in them like I, it's it's really crazy to think about how many pages that guy produced in his lifetime yeah i mean was he still working like in his like later years like was he still doing art i don't know i mean i don't think he was working as much when he was like into his 70s and he i'm not sure um mm-hmm. I don't think he was working as much. I know he lived into like he I think he probably died in like 1994. Like I don't think I'm not totally sure. Um, I don't think he was working as much, but um, anyways, it's crazy. We're talking about this so much. I didn't anticipate this, but uh, this is the kind of thing like I've been like obsessed with this since I was like a little kid so like it's like endlessly fascinating to me that's like it's a mystery like you know i don't think i don't think stan lee had zero input but he obviously he you know if you read stan lee's autobiography it reads as if he just came up with all of this completely by himself here is jack kirby saying that he came up with it all by himself you know yeah. so i don't know i think you know there's some mixture there's some there's some mill ground there but sure, sure it's like nobody is ever gonna know but um look listen to this here is jack kirby saying i created spider-man we decided to give it to steve dicko <laughs> but like you know so it's like i don't know like wow. he says he says i created the character i created the costume i created all those books but i couldn't do them all we decided to give the book to steve dicko who was the right man for the job he did a wonderful job on that like it, you know I don't think Jack Kirby created the Spider-Man costume. Okay. Like, I think that's wrong. Right. So. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I, I hear you. I don't know. Maybe he did. I, I don't know. I don't think so, but you know, it's it just... really funny to hear how much, I guess, drama behind the scenes there was. Cause it's like, I don't know. You think of Spider-Man and like these superhero comics and they're so like, silly like not i'm not trying to like write them off or anything but like it's 
it's people in spandex you know what i mean like flipping around in new york city like why are you all i mean i guess because it's like your intellectual property it's like i made this and other people in your opinion are taking credit for your ideas but yeah i mean jack kirby was like one of the great artists of the 20th century and just like i could see his point of view like imagine you're like an old man you're gonna die in a couple years and you fucking created like the silver surfer and like everybody thinks it's like stan lee that did it and you you created thor you created the hulk you created the x-men you you know like you created captain america and people think people probably think stan lee created captain america and he was that's not even one of the ones he was involved with at all so like you know i mean i you can imagine being like just a little bitter or whatever and by the way a lot better um, jack kirby had like you were saying like he produced like an insane amount of pages Mm -hmm. and like marvel really screwed him in the (laughs) sense that like they just like they just like held on to his pages and they were just like yeah we own those like the original art and like it was like a whole legal battle for decades to get them back and it's like a whole complicated thing um did he ever get them back i think he got some portion of them back and it's like a whole complicated thing where i think at one point they were like sign us over the rights to everything you ever created and then we'll give you like x number of pages back and you know and there was a whole thing where like his estate uh sued marvel like in the 2000s i believe to be like yeah and i don't know exactly how it was resolved i think it was resolved somehow and i i imagine like maybe the kirby's got some amount of millions of dollars or something i I don't know but um i'm just trying to paint you a picture of like there have been legal battles between jack kirby and his estate and marvel like for literally decades and decades so it's so crazy like just to think of like because i feel like these problems still exist you know like we're still seeing like creators like fighting for like the rights to their properties um yeah that's something like what was it aftershock that it's like Um, i forget i'm not sure i mean i think aftershock maybe Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I just if I say something, that it's <laughs> sorry, like, aftershock. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> I think maybe they were like not paying people or something, but like you, you really allegedly, and like I don't know. Like I'm not off the top of my head. I can't remember about that, but I know what you're saying that there was controversy with them. I think they actually shut down, didn't they, and fired everybody? That's or? what I thought but i can't remember now because there's i feel like there's been so many like publisher uh publishing houses that like have sort of been in hot water because of things like that they filed for bankruptcy right because so many of them are like ip farms right like they just want to like collect ideas and people weren't getting paid yeah and then they filed for bankruptcy aftershock fuck you (laughs) um Someone says like a famous writer who I won't name to be because it's probably smart not to say, but they say they owe friends of mine tens of thousands. And I've been doling out contact details of California lawyers like it was Christmas (sighs) candy. This is shameful behavior and people need to know. I don't know. You know, listen, Aftershock, don't be if if someone at Aftershock is listening, don't be mad at me. I don't know. Be be mad at me. Yeah, you can be mad at me. Um, I don't care. I think like. I think part of the reason why these businesses get away with it is because people are too afraid to talk about it. You know what I mean? They're worried. Yeah. Oh, if I like say something like I'm going to get blacklisted or I'm going to get like, you know, labeled as like difficult to work with or unprofessional or something. Yeah. What is more unprofessional than not paying your workers? You know what I mean? For sure. Like having to file for bankruptcy. Yeah. I mean, and like you said about the movie thing is, uh, a few days after that tweet I just said about the owing money, like they announced like aftershock and this movie company, uh, legendary announced their new deal to create a movie based on one of their books. So like, it's pretty much exactly what you're saying that it's like, yeah, I wonder who saw all that money. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it was a book made by Steve Orlando and Steve Fox. So 
Maybe oh. they did see money. I, I don't know, but um, it's called Party and Pray. Yeah, I, 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 I see think he. Fox if you're I think he follows me and 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 likes me. I, I guess or I don't know. But I um, actually talked to him and he doesn't like you. <laughs> I'm what? Just <laughs> I'm, just oh, okay. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and to be clear, we really I got into this. Ask. What's that? I should ask. I'm curious if he likes me. Like, uh, but, no <laughs> no i'm curious about um what happened you, with that you know, yeah yeah it was called yeah. party and pray interesting so i don't know oh this is probably this article i'm looking at is from 2022 december 2022 so that may as well be 100 years ago at this point sure well i hope they did see some money from it that'd be cool it says uh aftershock is saying they're addressing late payments as outstanding funds and owed to the company as outstanding funds owed to the company come in. There are no non payments. Everyone who is owed money will be paid. Blah, 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 blah. They continue to say. Okay. So, I don't like, know. Maybe people got hopefully paid. Hopefully everybody. Got, yeah. Hopefully everybody got paid, but also like you never know what kind of bills people missed counting on right. that money. You know what I mean? Like there's right, so much, yeah, definitely. there's so much stuff that goes on. Like, in everyone's life like not getting paid on time can Definitely. be really awful for certain people you know of course yeah it could you know you could be fucked you could be all right yeah now i can't pay the rent that i assumed i was going to be able to pay like now yeah. i'm increasingly getting into debt uh yes exactly you um, know um and, and i, I just want to say like that. sorry I said, and I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's like a major problem in the industry. Um, I don't know. I feel like since COVID broke out, like there really is like people are no like it used to be 10 years ago. N everyone would toe the line and nobody would, you know, people would just accept this as like, this is a problem right. that like insiders know about, but you're not going to like publicly call them out or whatever. And like, I really feel like post COVID, like that kind of changed where like people are no longer worried about that. Like, I think in general, just in the culture, there's a big time. Um, I don't know, like, I don't know what you call it, like labor movement, I guess. Like, you, you know, you see these sure. like, uh, like the writer strike going on right now. Yeah. You see like these like big time actors, like being like, like, uh, I feel bad. I forget the guy's name. Like the guy who plays like Connor Roy on succession. Like there's this video going around of him where he's like, just like saying like people should be paid what they're worth. Like, you know, the CEO of Disney like makes way more than like, you know, yeah. the lowest paid <laughs> worker, like 400 times more. Like it's insane. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's just crazy to see like these huge actors being like, I don't know. Uh, so pro labor or whatever, or like you yeah. never see something like this, like 15 years ago, you'd never see like Brian Cranston being like, uh, let's establish a communist. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> you'd never see well, like, you know, these huge guys like come out like this for like, whatever, like, a sure. Kind of mildly well, anti-capitalist. Okay you know attitude or whatever. or just yeah like i i saw a few people talk about like like um you know not like the stars of television shows but like actors that you like recognize like oh yeah i've seen them on you know this show and this show and this show right. like those are the people who are like right. needing like yeah. more money because like they're not you know what i mean they're, they're not brian Cranston. they're not exactly they're not movie yeah. stars but he, even brian cranston before he like was one of those guys dead. like yeah exactly so i think like he probably knows exactly what he's talking about and what i like about um there is i think a big labor movement that's sort of happening like across like it's not even just in the writers and the creative right. world like you see it with like ups and all right. sorts of like starbucks is unionizing and i'm i'm really hoping that this sort of like starts to get people in comics to think about you know what's possible for us because i think a lot of 
comics people just like you said they sort of have accepted like comics for what it is and there was just sort of this attitude of like don't talk about it it's just the way it is like late payments it happens blah 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 but it's fucking stupid bullshit in my opinion and i think it's like it's really unacceptable and yeah. i've been very very fortunate that like i have not been paid late i've always been paid on time which is something that a lot of people um you know can't say but i think that people i'm hoping people are a little bit more willing to sort of like talk about these things freely because it shouldn't be something like you know if a publisher doesn't pay you one time and you're waiting like months even years to get payment like you shouldn't be afraid to call them out yeah definitely i mean uh you know i'm right there with you i think it's like you know hopefully a good thing you know um i just saw yeah. i think just today i think the majority like 80 percent of like the disney like vfx animator mm -hmm. people like voted to unionize or that they want yeah. to i think it's like that they want to unionize i guess i don't know exactly yeah what that means but that's like a fairly big deal because you know all if, of their movies are in visual effects there's nothing for <laughs> no sure sense, i mean no and, and those guys yeah. are really like worked to the bone like those people yeah. um I mean, and that's like, like like you're saying like try to make a doctor strange movie without like you know visual animation like there's just yeah, no, you're never there is no do movie. It. yeah you're not gonna do anything and to me it's just like it, obviously it seems really simple like yeah just like be fair about the profit that you're making but nobody you know that's a naive fucking perspective i guess like, yeah why do that when you can pay them pennies and they can't right. do anything about it right yeah you know from my perspective it's like you know there's all these movies that's like okay this movie the budget is like 200 million dollars which mm -hmm. just that is like it's like the American pyramids. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's crazy to spend. It's like, all right, here's $250 million on this like superhero movie. And yeah. uh, I'm not going to name any specifically, but there are some superhero movies Why? where, well, <laughs> like, okay, because Why not? Because half the people will love me for it. Half of them will like bitterly disagree with me. But there are some mm. movies that I'm like, this comic book movie cost $200 million and it's so profoundly bad that I think it's worth it to watch just to be like, this is like $200 million. And this Are is what they did. about Wonder Woman 84? <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, that, I mean, I could say that's like, uh, I don't think I've seen that movie the whole way through, but I've like seen clips mm. of it and I've like, seen like you know youtube reviews of it and stuff <laughs> yeah. and that that it's is like really a good. isn't that like kind of a bizarre movie that like presumably like wonder woman should be like about like female empowerment right and yet like isn't it kind of like a little bit mis like i could be totally off the mark here but like there's a little bit of like a weird like misogynist element there that like um what's the actor's name who plays Cheetah, cheater, cheat. Am I Kristen Wig? Yes, Kristen Wig is like, like bitterly jealous of like Wonder Woman. It's like she only becomes a superhero because she wants to be like Wonder Woman. It's like this whole like, I don't know. It feels like kind of like the opposite of like. It feels a little sexist to me, to be honest with you. It feels like, you know, women competing with each other in a negative like bitter way and like, i don't know like you know i should be... didn't really absorb a whole lot from that movie um okay, but i think enough. at one point there's like this like sort of like rapey yes that's what i'm thinking character of. yes and like Kirsten Wiggs character like beats him up right like played as like oh my god you're a really bad person yes exactly that's what I, that's what I was thinking of yeah I was kind of yeah. like bungling my critique there but like that's what I was it's thinking of it's like all wait. just really bad though like it's right yeah that should be good They're like you know like a rapist yeah. is being punished <laughs> you're portraying yeah. it as like this is her villain turn 
you know? Yeah, she's turning into a bad guy for beating up this guy who's like sexually right. harassing her. Yeah. yeah. Wonder Woman to me is very interesting because um you know uh you look at like Batman and you look at Superman and Batman is very like I could explain to you who Batman is in one sentence. Like he's a billionaire whose parents were murdered in front of him so he became a crime fighter. Okay, boom. His parents there died? you go. Like yeah, I think so. I heard that's what I heard. <laughs> um, you know, Superman, it's an alien who was rocketed to a dying from a dying planet to Earth, and now he's like a superhero on Earth. Like these are easily understandable, you know? Oh. But then you talk about Wonder Woman, and it's like, well, she grew up on a mythical Greek island where there's only women who, by the way, are kind of quasi immortal and her mother shaped her out of clay so she's really a clay like given life by the greek gods also the greek gods exist and are real and you see what i'm saying like to explain who wonder woman is it's very convoluted and confusing and i think that presents a problem for these movies but uh i guess the movies streamline things by just being like yeah zeus is her dad like she's not made from clay like that's bullshit like and that may be smart on their part i, I don't oh, know but i but... think that would have been cooler <clears throat> it is interesting it's an interesting idea but um i'm like a big since i was like a young kid i'm like a big greek mythology guy uh-huh. like i love it like i love greek mythology so if it were me it's just like make a movie where like wonder woman is like fighting like uh like centaurs or something you know what i'm saying like make a movie where like wonder woman is like living greek mythology you know um i'd probably have hercules in there like i'd probably have her like you know i don't know like just like it's like there's have her fighting a bunch of giant cyclones you know sure like there's so much greek mythology and by the way it's all public domain so like you know, you could use whatever you want, like Cyclopses, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe just off the top of my head, have like, oh, Poseidon decides he's going to take over the world with, you know, you know, an army of like nymphs or something like it's it's that easy. Like, you know what I mean? Nymphs yeah. riding seahorses like, boom, yeah. there you go. Like, it's not. uh I don't know. I don't see it as like rocket science personally, but um, it's easy. Well, to I be mean, like, it's like, what's sorry. the point of these movies, right? Like, are we is it supposed to be fun? Like, are, yeah, I feel exactly. like with superhero stuff, like it's that's what it should be about. Like, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it should I be feel fun. Like they're yeah. not, though. <laughs> I don't know. I'm some of them like are. Some of them are not. I mean, from superhero stuff. <clears throat> yeah, I mean. It's a bizarre thing where um, half the time I feel like some of these superhero movies, they feel an obligation to be like, okay, we have to be nominated for best picture. And the other time I feel like they, they feel like we have to make $1.5 billion. And if we don't, we're failures. <laughs> like, And they have spend, any of them sorry, ever have any of them ever been nominated for best picture right now i think uh into the spider verse is i think oh interesting. I think so. and it won uh it won best animated picture the first one did well the spider yeah. nominated or am i wrong now if i'm if I, i'm wrong I, i'm gonna look like such a fucking idiot i'm not sure did i didn't really i liked the first one better I felt like the second one was um, <coughs> just like they struck gold with the first one and then they like tried really hard to do it again with the second one. Even though the animation was gorgeous. Um, I don't know. It felt very... Uh, okay, it's not nominated for Best Picture. I'm, I think I'm uh, wrong You're such that. a liar. Yeah, I'm a piece of shit. I was wrong. <laughs> it's got to be Best Animated Picture though, right? I, I would imagine, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even understand. Am I looking at the wrong thing? Like, <laughs> I might be. I'm not sure. No, I think I'm looking at the wrong thing. Son of a gun. 
Um, oh, I don't think they're out yet. That's what it is. They're not. Uh, I don't think they know. The yeah, they don't know what it is yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I uh, when I did you see Into the Spider Verse? That's what I haven't there. seen it. Um, I've been meaning to see it. Uh, I like the first one a lot. I mean, my my problem is a little bit like um, like I said, like I'm like a hardcore Spider Man guy. Like I, you know, I probably read like I want to say like the first 150 issues or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. um, and it's like one of the first comics I read, so it's like I'm particularly like emotionally attached to it, but um. I'm a little bit sick of like all the multiverse stuff where everything is constantly got to be like a multiverse. Um, mm. I just want to see like a good Spider-Man movie. Like I don't necessarily uh, want to see like 20 alternate Spider-Mans, but yeah, well, I think this will, <laughs> this is going to be that. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 There but was... on the other hand, um, since I was a little kid, I always loved like, loved like Scarlet Spider, like Spider-Man 2099. Like I always mm. loved like all the alternate versions of Spider-Man. So right. from, you know, I might like it just for that, just to be like, oh, look, Spider-Man 2099 or whatever. Like there's, there's probably dozens and dozens of examples of that in there. Yeah. But, um, I, um, my biggest problem with it was like can i spoil something for you or yeah i mean it's prefer? fine for me i mean if anyone listening to this doesn't want to hear it it's probably time i'm to, sure most to yeah skip this but most people probably have heard it but it doesn't bother me you know okay it's not like a like a plot spoiler it's just like a visual like something <laughs> that they incorporated into the movie that really rubbed me the wrong way um they had like live action like they use like the sony um films like in specific live action like moments oh and then weird. there were like so like toby mcguire yeah yeah and um, weird. andrew garfield um and then there was also i hope you can't my neighbor like blows his leaves for like three hours so hopefully that's not coming through on the audio oh no right i now. don't hear anything and like perfect i've got like the <laughs> ac running and i think there's like construction <laughs> outside so i, I hope you're okay. not like Hearing no, that, I haven't bad. heard. No, I haven't heard any of that. Um, I forget his name, but there was like a live action cameo from somebody, and I was like, "This feels like you're trying too hard to like link everything together, and everything right. needs to Tom be Holland, connected." And at, no, it wasn't Tom Holland. Okay, I got um, you. Oh my god! I not you. Not I almost said Jerry Maguire. Not uh, <laughs> Toby Maguire no, or not Toby Andrew Maguire. Garfield. Or... Okay, I got you. I oh, only know Oscar his Isaac, name. Perhaps? No, Charles okay, Gambino. sorry. I forget what. Oh yeah, name. yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, Danny Glover. Yes. Donald yes, Glover. Thank you. Yes, I'm <laughs> Danny Glover. <laughs> yeah, so he showed up for like, and it just like made that's interesting. Me cringe. That's um, kind of interesting though, because uh, if I remember correctly, like the whole idea of like a Miles Morales, like you know, like mm -hmm. an African American Spider Man. I think it kind of started with Donald Glover a little bit where he was like sort of as a joke, he was like, they should cast me as Spider-Man. And then, you know, Brian Bendis at Marvel and, and Marvel, you know, generally was like, wait, we should actually like make like a black Spider-Man like for real, you know, like, mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting or it's like kind of like, I guess the, maybe that makes a little bit more yeah, sense. If there's that might be part of, of why they did there. that. But it was just the application of like putting in these live action moments that just felt so. No, I hear you. Um, I hadn't heard of that. Like that's uh, that. I didn't even know about that. That does sound weird. Yeah, I hated it. Everything um, has to be like super interconnected, and it's just like just 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 tell me is about a just good plugging story. all of their other right. like properties right. and like their. Films Don't just see just this like one movie. Own see right. like our whole connected universe of movies yeah and it's like and I, I don't know that's why the first one worked really well for me because I, I it's been a while since i've seen it so maybe if i revisited it there would be some issues similar to this but it felt pretty standalone to me and yeah. it just felt like it was a fun 
like exciting movie that like you could tell like a lot of love was like behind it. Yeah, and not definitely. That there wasn't in this one, but this just felt like trying too hard to, you know, strike gold again. And it was like right. you, you're approaching it from like two very different, uh, I don't know, perspectives and executions. That's how I felt from it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a big trend now with like this like multiple universe stuff. I mean, you look at like the Flash, that's like was the whole movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but Yeah. No, absolutely not. Did you see it? I did. Yeah. I mean, it, to be honest did with you, you like it? <laughs> this is again, this is a, one of these movies where like a lot of the people we know would be like are like hardcore like lovers of that movie. Other people hate it. Like pr- it's probably like 50-50. So no matter what I say, like I'm guaranteed to annoy some people, but um, well, to be honest I with mean, you, <clears throat> sorry. I was just going to say like, what did you think? Like, you... Oh, uh, I was just going to say like, you know, I had fun. It was fine. Like it was, I had fun. Uh, there were plenty of times where I thought like Ezra Miller, despite being like allegedly a c- crazy criminal in real life, like, uh i thought he was pretty charismatic and funny like and i had fun like you know i'm also like a big time like michael keaton batman guy like that's like mm-hmm. them that's like one of my favorite movies of all time like in batman returns too um right so just for that like you know they got me like from a nostalgia angle just from that but uh that's how they it, always get you <laughs> yeah i mean I didn't see it in theaters though, to be fair. So they, you mm-hmm. know, they didn't get maximum money from me, but um, it was fine. Uh, uh, that having been like, I had fun. It was fine. That having been said, like, I'm also like a big flash guy. Like from when I was a little kid, like I literally was like on the internet, like in the earlier days of the internet, like reading about all the flash characters and storylines and stuff. Uh, which by the way when this comes out this will be way this will be like a million years ago but there was a big i don't know if you saw there was this big article like on comic book resources that basically was saying like there's a whole problem now with like these people on twitter who like are big comic fans but they don't read comics they just know about comics like through youtube videos and like it's like that's literally what i want like i that's that was me when i was like you know 13 or whatever so that i think that's fairly normal but i'm just saying you know to get back to the point like i would not do a flash movie that way like i would do it about the flash like it does like it was like uh dc universe the movie like it was all about like uh, yeah. it's all about okay uh this you know this universe is batman this is a alternate universe where superman is a woman like which is not bad by the way i'm just saying like all this stuff is like you know i just want to see the flash fight the weather wizard or captain cold or mirror master mirror master is probably the one i would want to see because that would be the most exciting visually in a visual medium like mirror master is probably the coolest like you know you you know just off the top of my head the flash like trapped in the mirror dimension you know like it's like so easy to see how that would be cool like um i want to see work the vfx artists to death yeah exactly i want to see like you know (laughs) it's like you know one of my favorite movies is like the matrix right and there's so many things in there where like it makes you think like oh my god could you imagine like a flash movie with like like um there's this moment in the matrix where like agent smith is like punching neo and his arms are like strobing really fast and it's like Mm -hmm. that's like straight out of the flat like it's like this kind of stuff just like you know meat and potatoes stuff just like you know you know show for example a guy shooting a machine gun and then the flash like darting in between all the bullets catching the bullets like you know what i'm saying like yeah it's like they didn't do that I mean, I don't know. Maybe they did something like that, but I'm just saying like (laughs) the whole movie is about like multiple universes and like it's about like the fate of the DC universe and just like 
yeah. who fucking cares? Yawn. Like, just show me the Flash, you know, fighting Gorilla Grodd, like a talking, <coughs> talking telepathic gorilla. Like, you know, that's what I want. Like, you know, make I it just a- like don't have any wants or desires for superhero things anymore. Like, the phenomenon is so dead to me now. No, like, I, I'm oh, just worn out. I come really on. am. It's, it's just exhausting. because, like, they're not, they're not good. <laughs> yeah, they're. It's it's like I said, like, make a Flash movie about the Flash and make it about the character. And you know, I feel like all, all like these movies on some level they're like ashamed of the characters. They're like, oh, we can't show you Superman like wearing red underpants on the outside. That's too mm. silly. Like we can't yeah. do that. Like we can't show you Jimmy Olsen. That's too silly. Well, like then why the are you fucking making these movies then if it's too silly? You know, like that's what it is. It's yeah. like it's like what you were saying before. Like these mo- these things are inherently yeah. silly. Like yeah. Batman is silly. It's a guy dressed up as a bat punching a clown. <laughs> like it's like yeah. you can't escape it. Like. I think you know. I I really like the Christopher Nolan movies. I, I was really just like them. Say it's his fault. <laughs> no, I mean I really like them. I'm not saying it's his fault, but I'm just saying you lose something when it has to be so real, like because they're not real. Like Superman really love will never be realistic. Much. Yeah, I do like them. I like them a lot. I'm just saying, like you know, like there's a Batman villain called uh, Clayface. Mm -hmm. and clayface could never be in a christopher nolan movie he's like a cartoon like or like mr freeze like you could never see mr freeze in the same universe as like you know uh the christopher nolan christian bale batman it's like too sci-fi too cartoony like but that's part of the dna of batman um so i don't know i would i would like to see them go like more silver age like more they surreal. They never will. In my opinion, they never yeah. will. Because I don't it's know. Just... So that was the first half of uh, my talk with Dylan Snook, and uh, it ran pretty long, so I'll be releasing it in two parts. Um, the second will come out next week. You can find Dylan at Dylan Snook Art on X, and check out his issues of Dead by Daylight, and uh, I think you could pre-order the trade paperback on Amazon now. All right, see you next week.